Before we get into today's video, some regulatory compliance. My name is Andrew Alexander. I am Head of Investments for Three Counties, an independent financial advisor based in County Durham, England. This video is for anyone who has an interest in investing and investment markets, both retail clients with no experience of investing through to industry professionals who invest for themselves and their clients. As independent financial advisors and wealth managers, there is no commercial relationship between ourselves and today's guest. The purpose of this video is educational and in no way should any of the content be construed as advice, nor is it an enticement to invest. Past performance is not a guide to future performance, nor a reliable indicator of future results or performance. The value of investments may go down as well as up and is not guaranteed. Therefore, investors may not get back the amount originally invested. Now, onto the video. Welcome everyone to another of our weekly investment manager videos and many thanks once again for tuning in. Uh, whilst many investors are focusing upon the US and understandably so to a degree, 2022 has started well for emerging markets despite a disappointing 2021. The question that many have is, is this down solely to an attractive entry point or is the region poised for a multi-year return to form? To answer this question and many more, I have the pleasure in talking to Tim Love, manager of the GAM Emerging Markets Equity Fund. But first, before we get into the content, and as predictable as ever, if you have not subscribed to the channel uh, currently, it would be marvellous if you could. It genuinely really does help us in delivering the weekly content, both investment management and financial planning every single week. So, on to the content. Um, Tim, many thanks for joining me today, and, and it's great to see you once again. Um, as I mentioned at the intro, um, gem indices disappointed in 2021. Why was that? A whole host of reasons. It was uh, like a perfect storm against you, really. But uh, the bottom line was uh, normalization of uh, economies, strange enough. When normalization occurs, people then start fretting about the speed of that recovery and the subsequent uh, PPI and CPI inflation impact. That leads to a more hawkish central bank tone globally. And then that leads towards fears of uh, 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 earnings not hitting their numbers through the cost of capital going up. Mm -hmm. So all of that uh, occurred at the same time, but throw on all the other ones, which were curveballs, such as supply chain issues, such as uh, CRB spikes in certain geographies, inability of certain sectors to pass through the, 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 the uh, input hikes. And then, of course, a whole list of uh, geopolitical risks starting in the South China Sea and morphing towards uh, Ukraine towards the end of the year, all of which kept uh, uh, a risk uh, uh, to a lower level than it would otherwise be. So put that together and uh, recognizing that the index has changed towards a more growthy bias uh, over the years uh, in emerging markets and therefore is more vulnerable towards higher cost of capital affecting those uh, jam tomorrow kind of concept growth plays, then uh, you were sitting, you're setting yourself up for uh, a, a, a short-term consolidation slash fall. And that's what happened. So nothing too uh, sinister, uh, a long list of negatives, but Bear in mind, emerging markets is uh, is already on its uh, backside, so uh, not a hell of a lot of absolute fall uh, in in an aggregate basis. Mm -hmm. Now, US outperformed twenty one, and year to date, it's it struggled. It it seems like it's the absolute reverse with emerging markets because kicking off this year, emerging markets have performed well, certainly on a on a relative basis. Do you believe that this will continue throughout this year and beyond? And, and why would that be the case? I think it started to continue in uh, January. And I think the trends are, are, are very strong and uh, very resilient. So I believe uh, for at least five reasons, you're going to get uh, continuity of that trend on a relative and an absolute basis of EM emerging markets outperforming DM developed markets. Mm -hmm. uh, one would be resilient earnings uh, with the normalization of uh, growth, uh, pent up demand, excess savings, easy comps, uh, and already back to pre-COVID uh, norms on hospitality trades in Latin America as an example. Mm -hmm. um, and the fact that weighted cost of capital in emerging markets has already gone uh, materially higher and therefore, they've been very orthodox in their, in, in their process, unlike the DM world, where they've been uh, dragging their feet and are way behind the curve. Uh, emerging markets has not been. Uh, and so policy rates have already uh, gone very, very materially higher, as has their two-year bond yields. So 
uh, if the dollar was to go a little bit higher, I don't think uh, it would have as much an effect uh, going forward. Mm-hmm. So resilient earnings and multiple expansion expect, uh, expected were at about a 12 PER, 11 and a half, 12, and that could easily go up to 16 to 18. Uh, uh, and then you've got investment grades in emerging markets. Eight of the top 10 are investment grade. And on top of which, you've got uh, a whole host of uh, index change work, which is uh, helping the expected earnings return. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then, of course, you've got ESG changes, which, given the fact that emerging markets are starting from a low base, has a disproportionate effect on the delta. So therefore, I think a lot of people are getting religion in terms of the uh, governance, let alone on the sustainable and the environmental and emerging. Mm-hmm. But they're coming off low basis. So they've got much further to travel on that card. And then, of course, risk adjusted returns. If you've got equal down to the US, uh, but you've got materially more uh, upside mm-hmm. on the multiple expansion, resiliency of earnings, uh, uh, investment grade lag at appealing to value growth and yield and the ESG argument, then by definition, why not go for it? Because you've got uh, an extremely favorable risk return quadrant at that, at, that, at that point of entry. And I think you're at that point right now. Okay. It's going to be interesting to see what happens and how this continues through, through the year and beyond. Um, looking so 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 coming looking down onto your um, your own fund, the GAM Emerging Markets Fund. How are you currently positioned? And and then also, where do you believe the most significant investor opportunities are within this huge geographical area? I think. Uh... Our methodology is always to identify high quality, and that mm-hmm. incorporates governance in the ESG, and then wait for that to present cheap. Uh, normally, that means that we're quite countercyclical because we're ahead of the game by buying a high quality, but when it is bombing or very, very cheap. And as such, where is the portfolio uh, already positioned in that regard? And it's got a cyclical bias to it, not only at the currency level, where a lot of commodity currencies are already on their backsides, have continued to improve their credit metrics and indeed their, their positive real rates and their undervalued uh, currency uh, uh, positions. Uh, but uh, in addition to which, uh, they have uh, positive uh, uh, carry trade yields. Um, um, and as such, put that together with uh, uh, the bottom up argument, namely that uh, a lot of these uh, uh, stocks on the cyclical side have fallen too far in anticipation of a hawkish Fed and a higher dollar, uh, a lot is in the price. So we're overweight to a lot of the cyclical sectors, uh, the materials, the energy, uh, uh, the industrials. Uh, and we're also overweight the banks on the grounds of uh, a steeper yield curve uh, helping the net interest margins. And put those together, that's about 40% of the index, all of that. Uh, um, and that's uh, in comparison to another 40% coming from uh, growth at reasonable price or concept growth. We're underweight concept growth, we're underweight healthcare, we're selectively uh, in line with uh, select pop- uh, possibilities in consumer discretionary, but we're overweight IT overall. And that goes back to what we call start versus fangs. Start is uh, Samsung, TSMC, Alibaba, Reliance and Tencent. And fangs is the, the US obvious, Facebook and uh, all its friends. Uh, and in that sense, uh, start is uh, not only cheaper, growing faster, but has already come back further uh, uh, courtesy of last year's pullback mm-hmm. due to the regulatory clampdown in, in China, in particular on Alibaba and Tencent, 50 odd and 25 odd hits yet last year alone. So I think to answer your question, a bias tilt towards cyclicality at currency, at country and at sector, mm-hmm. uh, um, keeping a growth at reasonable price exposure and keeping the yield exposure through real estate uh, and uh, very selective utilities on, on, on in addition other than that i think uh, that that'll uh, that'll get you through to a, 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 str- a strong uh, um, absolute return for the year hopefully a good relative one as well yeah he's he's hoping finally a bonus question i don't normally do this i normally keep the three questions but this is something that i really wanted to to, to ask you to do um you not only manage the, the 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 emerging market fund but you you also manage the the gam sustainable emerging market equity fund esg is hugely popular you've already mentioned it a couple of times in today's uh, discussion but esg is obviously the the big topic that 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 investors are uh, are very very interested in however ESG and emerging markets aren't necessarily um, the the first thing that you think of. Um, is is that is that the case? Is 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 is, is that unusual? Um, where are the opportunities? They're not natural bedfellows uh, to many people's minds. Um, 
governance has always been, however, a hidden secret in emerging markets. The better governance plays have always outperformed. Uh, take an example, Hindustan Unilever in, in India. It's always had access uh, over the decades to uh, um, a consistent uh, uh, access to weighted costs, uh, uh, reasonably priced, uh, 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 freshly priced uh, uh, cost of capital coming from its treasury operations. Uh, uh, and by definition, that's given it a, a tremendous advantage over its competitors locally. It's got an economy of scale. It's also got on top of that uh, uh, examples of, of uh, uh, best current practice or, on distribution um, from other countries uh, feeding into their, their model. Um, so those with uh, best governance practices have always outperformed. They've been part of our own philosophy of identifying high quality, the better governance. So that, if you like, will continue to work. But mm -hmm. where I think the real delta rate of change benefit comes from, the, 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 the best mileage, if you like, comes from those on the social or indeed on the environmental side, where a lot of companies are getting religion late. And uh, there's a huge amount of benefits coming from sustainability. As an example, if you push diversification, if you uh, increased your uh, awareness of local community links, if you increased your health and, uh, and safety, there's less downside, there's more upside, there's less resistance and you're reflecting your customer needs much more uh, closely to uh, your own uh, a composition of your own of your own company mm -hmm. um, and on e let's not uh, forget that most of the e in emerging markets oh, sorry in the, it, uh, in the globe is de derived from emerging markets mm -hmm. so if they're not part of the uh, of the uh, wave so to speak then uh, there's no way that a cop 26 is going to carry that very much weight mm -hmm. so again uh, the particular fund that you're mentioning is 50 odd percent lower on uh, carbon emissions, 75 low on fresh water intensity usage. So those kind of aspects are tremendously positive. Mm. But those we're invested in are ones which have got, got a lot more mileage to go as people find them, discover them and then re rate them subsequently. So growth uh, uh, um, in this case, uh, um, social aspects and then the environmental have a huge amount more to go, but active management over packs, passive, and being part of the solution rather than uh, being a, a holdout is, is very much uh, the key behind it. Not a natural bedfellow, no, but a huge amount of money to be made mm. uh, consistently by an, a, a, a well-regarded uh, active manager. Yeah, and and you know, obviously, I wanted to um, bring that to to to, to viewers because I, I I remember um, a number of weeks ago when uh, when we sat down and we spoke about that, and you were telling me all the opportunities because it doesn't sit it doesn't sit well. It's it's not the first area that you think of, but yeah, you're right. There huge amount of opportunities and impact as well, impact and change for for investors, which. You know, I, I I believe that's what ESG investors are looking for. They're, they're looking for the change, the real benefit to society, and uh, that might be something to look at. Anyway, Tim, it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you once again. Uh, it's always great to talk to you. Um, thank you very much for your time. Um, you stay safe, and I'm sure we'll catch up soon. Thank you very much for your time.